Chris Perry. Here in Nerdland, we have been watching Pope Francis since the white smoke emerged from the Vatican chimney back in March. And we love him, especially when he gets up close and personal with the people like he did last week. During the Vatican's Year of Faith celebration, a little boy just would not let the Pope be. And he did not seem to mind suffering the little child throughout the event and even seating the boy on his chair while he spoke. And on Wednesday, Pope Francis spotted a man in his audience who was severely disfigured by a rare disease. He went out and laid hands on the man, kissed him, and then prayed with him. This is the kind of embrace that so many of us, Catholic or not, hope to see from the world's religious leaders. But embracing everyone is not something that we're actually used to seeing from the Catholic Church, at least in terms of policy. These symbolic and touching acts illuminate Pope Francis's efforts to open up discourse on doctrine that the church hasn't been willing to seriously consider changing in, well, pretty much ever. Now this week, the Pope opened up discourse in an unprecedented way. He is polling Catholics, sending surveys to parishes around the globe, asking questions ranging from what pastoral attention can be given to people who live in these types of, that is, same-sex unions, and in cases where non-practicing Catholics or declared non-believers request the celebration of marriage, describe how this pastoral challenge is dealt with. Also, do the divorced and remarried feel marginalized or suffer from the impossibility of receiving the sacraments? Now, if you're not Catholic or if you're a lapsed Catholic, you may think, what difference does all of this make to me? But it does. It could be a difference of life or death because the policy of the Pope and of the church that he leads has a reach that affects all of us. That's because the Catholic Church isn't just a church, could very well be your hospital too. New information from the ACLU and nonprofit organizations like Merger Watch indicate that while the number of American public and secular nonprofit hospitals dropped dramatically between 2001 and 2011, the number of hospitals affiliated with the Catholic Church shot up 16% during that time. According to Mother Jones, 10 of the 25 largest nonprofit hospital systems in the country are Catholic, and Catholic hospitals care for one in six patients. Those hospitals get their orders from the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, a very conservative group now tussling with the Obama White House over the Affordable Care Act and contraception. Those bishops are the men who are setting hospital policy on issues ranging from providing information about available treatments to addressing the tragedies of abnormal pregnancy to dispensing birth control for women, and their reach is growing. Joining me now is Lewis Utley, excuse me, Lois Utley, who is director of the Merger Watch Project, which focuses on the issue of Catholic hospital takeovers. Often Brian Stiltner, who's chairperson of the Department of Philosophy, Theology, and Religious Studies at Sacred Heart University in Connecticut. Deborah Stolberg, who is a family physician at the University of Chicago, who previously worked at a non-secular hospital that was taken over by a Catholic one. And Teresa Younger, an activist from Connecticut, who was part of a successful campaign in her community to prevent a hospital merger. So nice to have you all here at the table. Thank you. So talk to me a little bit about the merger watch, about what we are seeing and why there are more Catholic hospitals now. Merger Watch has noticed an enormous increase in the number of Catholic hospitals all across the country. Part of it is that Catholic hospitals have organized themselves into giant systems like Ascension Healthcare, mm -hmm. which now runs 93 hospitals in 23 states across this country. It has uh, annual revenues of $6 billion, and half of that comes from our public money through Medicare and Medicaid reimbursements. As these hospital systems get bigger and bigger, they take over non-Catholic hospitals, and that's where we're seeing a real problem. We're seeing circumstances like in uh, southeastern Arizona, where a woman suffering a miscarriage went to the emergency room at the local hospital. The doctors there said, we're really sorry, but you can't, this pregnancy is not going to make it. We should end it now to prevent infection. And then the hospital administrator said, oh, no, wait, that's against the Catholic rules. And they sent this poor woman 80 miles away to Tucson for treatment. That's not right. And, you know, those kinds of stories conflict so fundamentally with the things that I love best about the Catholic Church. And, and not just about the Catholic Church, but about Catholic hospitals, which have often sort of stood in the gap for the poor, stood in the gap for underserved communities. But, but then when... When it comes up against a faith claim, suddenly medical care can't be provided. How do we reconcile something like that? Well, we do have to admit that it's a, you know, a possible tension. And 
I think it's going to be a matter of what message you want to lead with and what's going to end and whether you're going to kind of give the benefit of the doubt. And I think for many years coming out of the 1960s and the Second Vatican Council, and where the Catholic Church historically has always wanted to put its best foot forward is that, you know, serving the common good, helping those who are most vulnerable, helping the poor. And that's, and they would point out, the, you know, at the start of a conversation like this, that we do serve so many people through hospitals, social charities, and education, and we should be respected as a player in society in, in all these ways, and they are. But then the other side of that is we don't want to give up our distinctive, yep. you know, beliefs when we kind of go into the public sphere. And that's true, and there has to be a balance struck there. But what I think in kind of the recent years, uh, the, the bishops, you know, kind of John, under John Paul and Benedict, um, have been so concerned about just our religious freedom mm -hmm. and the distinctiveness of our institutions um, that they're always leaning with that foot. And like you, I'm, I'm kind of hoping that Pope Francis might say it's this it's this other face of the church that's really got to be our our, our, our key face. So let, talk to me as a as a doctor on this question. Um, what does it mean to to say to someone, I see that you need this medical care. I am capable of providing this medical care for you, but there is an administrator responding to a faith claim which says I cannot provide this medical That's that exactly right. <laughs> it's, it's very hard. Um, I experienced it when my hospital where I was working um, got taken over by a Catholic hospital and since then I've talked to a lot of doctors who have had a similar experience trying to take the best care of women that they can, that their training tells them to, that the care that women want based on their own values. Mm -hmm. And um, as they say, here's the treatment you need here, you know, we're trying to preserve your health. And then there's an outside force, you know, often someone with no medical training mm -hmm. um, who says, sorry, not here. Uh, and it may mean, as Lois is describing, a patient has to travel the delay in treatment can actually risk further harm to the woman. Um, or it may mean she doesn't get the treatment at all, in some cases doesn't even know it's an option for her. So, so this piece is, is one uh, of the pieces that is most distressing to me, and that is that not even information can often be given. Correct. So it's one thing to say, for example, we're not in this facility going to provide abortions on demand, whatever that means, right? But it's another thing to say, we're not going to tell you <laughs> that, that birth control pills exist, and we're not going to tell you that these sets of options exist. How, as you have sort of tried to work with communities to push back, what are the things that really rile people up when they learn about the Catholic health policies? Well, I think, you know, many people pick hospitals that are in their communities. They don't even know that right. they're functioning under these administrative yep. uh, restrictions in any way, shape, or form. But I think what happens, it, you know, it's not about abortion. Yeah. At the end of the day, you know, it, what we saw in Connecticut when we were working on this, it was about tubal ligations. It was about a woman who had two children mm -hmm. and she and her partner uh, decided that they no longer wanted to have children and that they were going to use tubal ligation as a means of birth control. And that the hospital was telling them, you can't have that procedure done here. Even during a C-section. Even during a C-section. Right. So when you've already it's, opened, it's, right. it's you're right. already there, yep. you know. And so, you know, what it says is that women and their families cannot make the health decisions mm -hmm. that they need to make that are best for them and their families. Mm -hmm. And or it means that a community is going to be without any kind of access to these health services. And, and we've been hearing so much in the pushback against um, ACA, this idea of government being between you and your doctor. And, and literally, I mean, I really love this Pope, Pope Francis, he's the best, but I don't really want this guy or anybody else between me and the medical decisions right. that I am making. And often it's the local bishop, which actually can change. I've talked to a number of doctors who were told when they took a job at a Catholic hospital, your medical judgment and what's best for the patient will be the most important thing and we will not get in your way. And then a month later, a new bishop is appointed and they say all the rules when, you know, have changed and suddenly every case of uh, impending miscarriage like this, you know, we have to send to the ethics committee. And again, it's a delay in treatment for the woman, uh, no medical reason for this delay. Stay with us. We're going to be a little bit more on this as we come back. Um, and, and but first, I also want to just sort of point you. We have an issue um, on. We have a piece about this issue on our website right now, mhpshow.com. It is a terrific piece by a reporter here, Mer Meredith Clark. When we come back, I want to get more into the issue of how communities are pushing back against these mergers and if it means that they're going to have to risk having no hospital at all. <laughs> 
an example of the growing impact of Catholic hospitals is unfolding in Washington State. According to a recent ProPublica report, despite Washington State's recent victories for pot legalization, marriage equality, and reproductive rights, one area where voters haven't had much of a say at all is in the wave of mergers and alliances between Catholic hospital chains and secular taxpayer-supported community hospitals. By the end of this year, the ACLU estimates nearly half of Washington State's hospital beds could be under Catholic influence or outright control. The scenario is a common one. Taxpayer support hasn't been enough to keep many of these hospitals afloat on their own, so they seek out alliances to stay open. And if that alliance is with a Catholic institution, they would be likely bound by the ethical and religious directives for Catholic health care services. Among those directives, it is not permissible to initiate or recommend treatments for sexual assault victims that have as their purpose or direct effect the removal, destruction, or interference with the implantation of a fertilized ovum. In other words, not only do these hospitals deny rape survivors abortion access, information, or counseling, they also deny them the emergency contraception, which is routinely provided to sexual assault survivors so that they won't have to face the possibility of carrying a pregnancy resulting from rape. Washington's Democratic governor and attorney general are both fighting back, directing the state's Department of Health to update its hospital merger oversight process and require that all public hospital districts that offer maternity service also provide birth control and abortions. But it remains to be seen how effective that they're going to be. Now, one of the, the questions I had is, so if you end up with delayed access and negative health consequences as a result, are Catholic hospitals, because they're operating under this directive, somehow free from tort and, um, and malpractice suits? Because typically that's the thing that sort of pushes providers to behave in one way or another. There have been cases of uh, rape victims suing when they were not given emergency contraception. The problem is in, in the cases where they sued, they were denied the information, but luckily they didn't become pregnant. So there was no damages mm -hmm. that they could prove. Um, the Catholic Hospital has been getting better on this problem of emergency contraception for rape victims, but it's still inconsistent. Mm -hmm. Really the biggest problem now, and it's at these Washington cases that you spoke about, is these emergency services and also tubal ligation. Mm -hmm. You know, this point that was made earlier before the break, that it, that it actually matters sort of bishop to bishop, that surprised me. I guess I was thinking that the Catholic Church was a little more hierarchical in that sense. So if we were to see new policies coming out from the Vatican after Pope Francis's great survey, how long would it take for that to impact a Washington Catholic uh, hospital or a Connecticut one? It seems like it could take a while, mm -hmm. um, although sometimes some things have happened quite dramatically in a fairly short period of time in the Catholic Church in the 1960s, and that Pope mm -hmm. coming in, John the 23rd, setting a new tone, seemed to make a change, not just because you had to get rid of some older, stodgier people maybe who were very conservative, but because deep in the hearts of a lot of those bishops, they were looking for this breath of fresh air, mm -hmm. and he authorized it. So the influence would be on... I think like it always is with the Vatican, there's, it's a political dimension as well. There's mm -hmm. negotiating behind the scenes. There's pressure that their offices could put on national conferences. Um, but a change on hospital policy in the U.S. would be, you know, getting kind of the key cardinals and leaders in the U.S. to work in the conference mm -hmm. of Catholic bishops to make adjustments in the health care directives that guide hospitals. And, and it feels to me like that's important in part because for communities, the choice between no hospital and a Catholic hospital might often lead to them saying, okay, well then we're going to choose the Catholic hospital because there are so many kinds of services that communities need. Uh, absolutely. In, in the state of Connecticut, I, I work for the Permanent Commission on Status of Women, which looks at public policy around all women's issues. And one of the things that government needs to do is to determine how it's going to help reimburse uh, medical services and mm. if it's a legal service do we let one religious stand dictate to an entire community mm -hmm. what's going to be happening and what's available to those members of the community and I think that's really an important key um, link that we need to be aware of is is there may only be one hospital within that community for hundreds of miles. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is not just a matter of going to the next hospital that's the next town over, but if the next hospital that might even provide the service you're looking for is 50 miles away and there's no transportation yep. to get there, yep. then government 
we believe, has a role in playing and setting the standards around what services are available yep. in those communities. So, you know, hospitals, whether they are Catholic or not, provide a service to the community. They need to let the community know what services are being offered and how they're going to support what services are not being offered. And one of the things you said is if a, if a procedure is legal, then, you know, and then we go on to access. And so I wanted to ask you just finally, Doctor, on this question of access, it feels to me like one of the possibilities here is that there's a bigger coalition that when we talk about abortion and termination services, it sometimes shrinks the coalition. But if we talk about tubal ligation and IVF and all of these other exactly. sort of women's reproductive health services that are legal, <laughs> right, um, and, we, and we, we grow that coalition, is that part of how we can make this point. push? And yeah. In fact, we know that the vast majority of American women use contraception yeah. at some point in their life, Even including Catholic, Catholic women. <laughs> yes. Exactly. And even contraception is prohibited within the ethical and religious mm -hmm. directives for Catholic health care services. And, you know, if you put a big sign up that said no birth control here, do you think many patients would come? No, women would seek services elsewhere because it is a needed mm -hmm. fundamental service for women. And so part of it, I think, is also about being open um, and then being willing to be in dialogue about what services women need. Yeah. Thank you. This, this has been a this has been something we've been really closely following. And it's a, it's a deep question of, of access in many different ways. Thanks to Lois Utley and to Brian.